Welcome, bienvenue, Fulcher Road is Jock. Thank you for joining us this evening at Belfast International Festival and with Centre Culturel Irlandais as we host a special event about the new Curation for Poetry jukebox, No Word for Stay. Poetry Jukebox launched at Belfast International Festival in 2017. It was a first in the UK and in Ireland. From the start, it has been an all-island project, but it quickly became international. Submissions came from across the globe, from diaspora, as well as international poets. Our jukeboxes are currently outside Epic Museum in Dublin, as well as in Belfast. Centre Culturel Irlande in Paris, our partners for this event, have also got their own jukebox now. So that through to the future, we can continue to share beautiful, evocative and thought provoking words in public spaces. Our inspiration for this curation of poems finds its locus in Seamus Dean's poem, Strange Country. This is an excerpt. It is too simple to say I miss you. If there were a language that could not say leave and had no word for stay, that would be the tongue for this strange country. He was, of course, writing about the North and about the context of the Troubles. Our current turbulent social, political and cultural context includes questions of identity, belonging, loss, grief, hope, the need for change and uncertainty about the way forward. We cannot disregard the pandemic, Brexit, the border, the EU. And yet here we are, individuals, neighbours, friends, families and adversaries alike, grappling with the present, reaching to the future and still reckoning with and processing the past. Words matter. We turn to our poets for inspiration, for nuance, for perspective, and for the opportunity to reflect, to consider, and to connect with ourselves. Sometimes the farthest distance language must travel is between one person and another. And sometimes it is within our own selves. The poems in this collection are all poets of the North, people with lived experience of the Troubles, men and women. We include The Mighty Ceasefire by Michael Longley, new work from Celia de Frenia, Gerald Daw, Joan Newman, Kate Newman, Colette Bryce, Frank Ormsby, Alan Gillis and Leon Flynn. You can listen to a thundering poem in Irish and in English by Garage McLaughlin, amongst others. We also include poets that we miss now, the late Kieran Carson, Podrick Fake, and our own Derek Mahan, who kindly contributed, everything is going to be all right. His death has come to us suddenly after our programme was recorded and before we broadcast tonight. Given COVID restrictions, all the poems are available online via our homepage at www.quotidian.ie as well as through the websites of our collaborating partners. We are grateful to our poets, to the publishers, partners and sponsors for their support and offer special thanks to the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, to Epic Museum Dublin, Poetry Ireland, the Crescent Arts Centre and photographer Crispin Rodwell for the use of his images. Stay with us now 
here at Belfast International Festival and Centre Culturel Irlande, we present to you a discussion, No Word for Stay, chaired by Professor Clenany Reardon from Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris, our own Paul Muldoon, who joins us from New York, and poets Gail McConnell and major artist awardee uh, Moira Donaldson here in Belfast for our discussion panel. Sit back, reflect, enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this conversation uh, between a number of Northern Irish poets, Moira Donaldson, um, who is co-curator of this initiative uh, for the jukebox on the Troubles uh, called No World for Stay. Uh, Gail McConnell, um, who is a poet and academic based in Belfast. Uh, Paul Muldoon, um, a poet, academic, broadcaster, musician, um, who's joining us from the United States. Um, and I wanted to start by reading the extract from the poem, uh, which was the cue for the curation. It's an extract from a poem uh, by Seamus Dean, Strange Country, No World for Stay. It is too simple to say I miss you if there were a language that could not say leave and had no word for stay, that would be the tongue for this strange country. And I wonder, um, more if you could explain to us what what led you to pick this topic or this this extract well when maria invited me to uh co-curate this jukebox project um and i saw the same seamus dean poem i spoke to an old school friend about it um quoted it to her and i thought her response was really interesting because she kind of laughed um, rather uh, ironically and said um, staying in Northern Ireland was a bit like staying in an abusive relationship. Um, she's around the same age as me growing up in the kind of 70s and 80s in the North. She herself left um, after university, got a job in London and then moved on across Europe. And I thought that was a really interesting place to start from, the idea of having that kind of um, slightly um, abusive relationship with the place that you live in. I thought that was really interesting to me personally. Perhaps we could look at one of the photographs that are being used to illustrate um, this conversation. There are two black and white photographs by Kristen Ro Crispin Rodwell. First um, shows a car bomb. And I suppose these are the images that were associated with Northern Ireland um, in that period. Um, and when when you're when you're raised the question of no word for stay and people leaving um it it also brings us to for example Seamus Heaney who left Belfast in 1973 and moved to County Wicklow um and it was r regarded in some quarters as a betrayal or a running away um could could you say why people felt that so strongly Paul? Um, you know, I'm not sure if I ever met anyone <laughs> who thought that Seamus Heaney moving to Wicklow was a betrayal. Um, it's conceivable there were. I can't quite parse it myself. I don't know what that means. Um, you know, to move to, move to Wicklow, uh, there were various reasons why Seamus Heaney moved to Wicklow, having to do with his family, a young family. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think he was living in, uh, he was living off the Lisburn Road. It was, it was a little bit dicey, as most of the time was. But betrayal, I'm not so sure. I mean, that's a rather, a rather, um, a rather strong term, and it's not one that I would necessarily buy into. I, I, I certainly never thought of him as I'd be betrayed anyone, including those of us who stayed for a bit longer. I mean, I lived in Belfast between 1969 and 1986, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite an innings. But I'm sort of not looking for brownie points for it. It just happened to be where I was. And it was. It happens, as, many, as you know, it happens that 
we, one of our great gifts as human beings is that we get used to almost anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the car bomb became a feature of our lives. Uh, the bomb scare was a, a feature of our lives. I used to work in Windsor House, as it was then known, known. it's now the Grand Central Hotel. And you could set your clock on a Friday afternoon, someone would be phoning in the bomb scare. That was how we lived. I still, when I go back to Belfast, which is all the time, by the way, uh, when I'm walking down the street, I see a car, I still can't quite believe that uh, I, I should be giving it a wide berth, you know? Mm -hmm. I think, though, that, you know, in some ways, I, I totally agree with you, Paul, but I think that um, looking at some of those photographs that are part of this curation, um, I find, uh, you know, I had such a visceral reaction to them because they are so powerful and so shocking. And to think that, yes, this was what we lived through. And you're absolutely right, it became the normality, it became what you expected on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think seeing the photographs from this kind of uh, slight distance now, I find them just incredibly um, shocking. And incre I find myself incredibly emotionally moved by the fact that this was what we lived through, this was life, this was daily life here. Um, and I think, um, you know, to be reminded of it so starkly in those photographs, I find it quite a, sh a shock to my own kind of emotional uh, balance. Well, I think we need to be reminded of it. Uh, I really think we do. Um, you know, for many younger people in a way, they're in, in Northern Ireland, they're blessed in some sense that they have not had to endure that. On the other hand, there, there's a risk, I believe, that simply because they didn't have to endure it, they have no idea of what, um, what going back to that, the, that way of life um, uh, would mean. And um, I think, I suspect there are still some people who romanticize those days. And, um, you know, the reality of it was, was far from romantic. I suppose I think about Lyra McKee's life and death, in fact, and the lessons that she, I think, has tried to articulate about the ways in which her generation and a younger generation are inheriting the troubles. They may not be experiencing a lived reality of violence or, or of bomb scares in the way that we're describing, but they are feeling the brutal force, I think, of the aftermath of this conflict in terms of their mental health, in terms of the way austerity politics and Brexit has had an effect on the North, in terms of even the transport system that we have running through Belfast, where you can't take a bus from the west of the city to the south, but everything has to go through the centre of the town, that kind of ludo board of our bus system network, which is a um, even the way that we speak about north, south, east and west, that kind of journalistic shorthand for the place that we live now and we have areas of huge social and economic deprivation that um, are and we have more peace falls now than we did in 1998 so we do have a, a, a younger generation who are very much inheriting this history this troubled history in ways that may not be about um, the bomb scares the artificial limbs um, the bombs that are detailed in some of the poems here but that are absolutely about the legacy of this history in ways that are profound and far-reaching and and difficult to quite the losses I think are are differently visible for that generation and some of the things that I loved and admired in the poems in this collection are the ways the, the many ways in which they seek to articulate losses um, of lives yes but much more subtle losses too of language of of time, of history, of words, of all kinds of ways that loss has made, it, made itself felt. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that word stay that we were just talking about, it's such a slippery word because, of course, yes, it means about rema it's about remaining, but a stay is also a curb, a stop on something. Mm -hmm. And it's also, you know, it calls up frost and the kind of the idea of the poem and the, the momentary stay against confusion or the possibility of that momentary stay, the clarification of life, but not a great one, you know, that the moment that the poem exists in and the time of these poems that might be a stay against everything, a moment to, to look anew 
and more clearly, but just briefly, at something. And so it's such a rich word for me and it's so loaded with all of those many meanings and, it, and it's transformed and, and, and in many ways across this extraordinary um, collection of 20 poems, the word stay comes up again and again in really interesting ways, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think we're only starting to, to um, understand about intergenerational trauma and just the effect that that, that has on, on generations that, as you say, weren't necessarily walking past the bomb, but um, the effects are there for them. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What I com would I initially compared this curation to was um, a volume of poems that was edited, an anthology edited by Frank Wormsby um, in 1992, um, which took as its title a uh, quotation from uh, Derek Mahan, Rage for Order. And what struck me in that anthology, which is also a form of curation, is that there were very few women in it and that the focus was very much on the, the first several sections of it were on a focus on conflict and a final section, uh, a focus on, on hope. Whereas I think that this uh, curation, because of the temporal span that we're in, um, seems to balance that um, reflection on the effects of the conflict and the lived in moments and the positive things uh, to a greater extent. Yes, I mean, I think for me, um, it was one of the, the most positive things about being involved in this curation was that opportunity to um, to hear so many different voices and so many different perspectives. Um, and I think, um, I mean, I went to, to Queen's in the, I went to Queen's in 1974 and I went there wanting to be a writer. And at that time, um, for a number of reasons, um, I found myself quite silenced. Um, and one of the reasons was that I couldn't find any other contemporary uh, women's voices um, in poetry. And, you know, that kind of the influence of absences is quite powerful. Um, and I came back into writing again because I knew it was, it was what I wanted to do. But also I came in through, um, I suppose, what you could call a, almost a community arts route um, into groups. And I became quite involved in the community arts movement. Um, because of its focus on um, the, the unheard voices, the voices that don't get the chance to tell their stories and that need to be heard. Um, and that's an ongoing process at the moment. Um, and I think that the more voices we hear, the more stories we hear, the more perspectives we hear them from, the better. And it was a real delight for me to be able to, to um, include all these women's voices um, speaking for themselves. What about you, Gail? Um, you contributed to uh, the jukebox. I think your poem is, um, it start out, am I correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, I suppose it's, well, it's a poem, it's probably worth saying that's indebted to a poem by someone else on this panel, um, who, uh, Paul, um, they that wash on Thursday, which is an extraordinary poem in which the last word of every line is hands. And I liked the idea of that repetition. I liked the idea of putting pressure on a particular word and seeing just how far you could um, stretch its meaning or yeah, put pressure on the ways in which it um, changes its meaning in different contexts. So I kind of, I suppose, took that poem as a, a starting point for a start out of my own and the poem, is about many things, I think, um, but in part it addresses my father, who was a prison governor in the maze, who was shot and killed outside our house um, when I was three in 1984. And thinking about his death, and I suppose this kind of very, you know, obvious loss, um, doing that through um, through poems has been. Well, it's, it's, it's been, I don't know what it's been, it's been all kinds of things, but being able to speak to him and find myself doing that in a poem in a way that I haven't, you know, haven't had a, a chance to do in any other way in my life has been um, just kind of fascinating for myself, I suppose. But it's a poem that tries to think about that difficult history and that contested history and the difficulty of um, 
his absence as well and the difficulty of not being able to, to speak and the difficulty of him not being able to speak back. And I think a lot of that complexity we see elsewhere in this collection with poems that are thinking about how do we address the dead and how do we address the newborn, the newly born into this society? How do we think about naming the dead and, and how do dates work? How do we think about anniversaries? How do we commemorate? How do we, how do we think about the politics of commemoration? So many of those questions are raised, I think, in this curation and um, there is difficulty and complexity in these individual responses in ways that I find um, very rich and uh, there's a through line, I think, also through the 20 poems that are here that makes them really worth listening to as a sort of playlist from start to finish. There are mm. all kinds of threads, and I think threading and yarn and, and weaving and all of that is, is, is also there in the kind of pattern of the, um, of the whole, if you like, from the, the very first poem all the way to the birds chirping at the end of Derek Mahan's recording. Um, I don't know, Moira, how conscious you were of kind of wanting to kind of trace some of those through lines, but certainly the connections that, that link them are kind of fascinating, as fascinating to me, I suppose, as the, some of the poems themselves. Yeah, I'm really pleased that you felt that. It certainly was something that I wanted to do, to have almost that kind of, almost like a narrative arc uh, through the whole curation. Yeah. Mm. And the idea of a jukebox and the idea of the variations in accent that we also hear, how important do you think it is that what we're dealing with is a curation and a series of live voices um, as opposed to um, a paper anthology? Do you think the impact is different? I loved hearing the, the voices. Um, I, I loved hearing the, uh, the different accents, the different sort of, the way that um, time affects your voice as well, not only in the words you use, but in the actual strength of your of your voice. Um, I just find it fascinating to hear all those poems in the voice of the poet. It's I, I love the idea of the jukebox. Uh, I, I have a, a sense of a jukebox, not as a kind of monolithic item sitting in a, a cafe, say, but I used to love those um, personal jukeboxes, if you remember those, again, often in a cafe, a coffee shop or whatever, where at each booth, there'd be a little jukebox. <laughs> and like your private, you kind of your private um, listening session um, on one hand, and I think that's one of the beauties about this, it's very, very directed. Um, it's almost as if it's theater for one. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful uh, New York um, phenomenon called Theater for One, where you go to a show and you're the only person in the audience. So there's that aspect of it. But then there's the sense that actually, and it's true of those little jukeboxes uh, in, in the booth, the neighbors can listen in too. And so you're actually sharing your, your own taste of what you've selected with uh, a somewhat larger um, range of listeners. And I love that idea. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact that uh, poetry, even many poems that are usually alive on the page, um, or more often alive on the page, most poems, not all, but most have another aspect to them somehow when they're read aloud and even more so when they're read aloud by the people through whom they were written. So there are so many fascinating aspects of it. Uh, I think it's, just, it's a great idea. I think so many of us now, because of lockdown and because of COVID, are, are living often with um, headphones in our ears for meetings of all kinds. We're, do we're doing it right now. And there's something differently intimate for me about listening to these poems on my own, not in an audience, not at a live event, but being within earshot of these poems, um, just off, you know, through headphones, there's something very differently intimate about that experience, I think, than the shared experience of listening in a room, which I think is maybe can allow them to be arresting in different ways. Um, 
Or, yes, as you say, that, you know, there's a sense in which they can be drifting out from your speakers sort of around the home as just everydayness is going on and you're playing with a toddler and making a cup of tea and doing the things that you're doing. So I, I love that this is a kind of sonic curation and I love that you can pick and mix from the poems, but also that it, that it does bear playing kind of start to finish, really. I think there's, you know, there's always something about that. It almost takes you back to the, the kind of memory of being read to as a child. There's that kind of intimacy to it that that you are the person who's being read to. There's that kind of feeling about it, which mm. I think really adds something to the to the poem. Mm. Yeah. And at the same time, because the jukeboxes are put in public spaces, um, if we look at the places that, that they're going to be in the Crescent Art Centre in Belfast, the Epic Museum in Dublin, um, and the Centre Culturel Irlandais in Paris from January. Um, so I was at Culture Night in the Centre Culturel last Friday, and there were a group of people standing around the present curation um, that's in the jukebox, and they were cranking the handle and listening. And so it was also a shared experience, mm. and a shared experience that's transported um, to these different places. Um, to Paris, to Belfast, to Dublin, and the impact I imagine in each of those places will be different. How do you think people in, in Belfast will feel when they go to the Crescent Art Centre and they listen to this curation? Well, I mean, I think, um, I think one of Maria's ideas about the jukebox, one of the motivations for Maria, um, I'm not speaking for her, but my understanding of what she's doing or trying to do with the jukebox, is to bring those other voices, those quieter voices, um, out onto the street, into public places, so that people can hear them. There's such a cacophony of noise from politicians and from political groups, and um, you know we're bombarded all the time by um, by very uh, tramlined, by very cliched views of things. And I think the opportunity for people to hear different voices, to hear the, the intimacy that there is in those poems, to hear other people's lived experience, um, I think that's a fantastic thing. And it means that, you know, someone's just walking into the Crescent Arts Centre to go to a class or whatever, and they press a button and are able to listen to a poem. Um, that's someone that maybe wouldn't have gone and looked for that poem, but it's been brought to them uh, through this jukebox initiative. For, um, if we could come and talk about some of the individual poems, I think, Gail, you referred to the inspiration that you had. One of the things that seems to me is the fact that the poems frequently are talking to each other, mm. um, that you have uh, Gerald Dawes poem um, dedicated to the memory of Podrick Fierk, and then you have Podrick Fierk reading his poem. And there are, um, it's as if people are speaking to each other across the generations. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is a poetry, if we think about poetry of this place, broadly speaking, that is writing very much with an awareness of the past and of the pastness of the past, if you like, you know, right the way back um, through the century, back to Yeats and further still. Um, so I think there is a way in which some of those debates across the last hundred years or so about poetic responsibility, about what the lyric can do, about elegy, you know, they're picked up um, and transformed. Yes, generation on generation, but, you know, in, in ways that are even more kind of intricate and um, strange than that, I think. So absolutely, there's a sense in which some of these poems are in very conscious dialogue with one another and poets in dialogue with one another. Um, but also, uh, you know, and part of that is about teaching and, and mentorship as well that, that has happened in, in relationships. Um, but also just there are lovely ways in the kind of happenstance of it that some of these poems chime one with the other where, you know, a radio from Leontia Flynn's poem, then there's a radio that gets hit by a brick in mine. There are lots of images I was saying earlier of, um, you know, we start out at the very, at the very beginning of this um, Creation, a dropped stitch, Celia Dufresne's poem. The future was once a matinee jacket made from angora wool, is how, how the English begins. Um, so we start with a sense of the future, but it's a future that was. So there's this strange thing happening with time in this, which is then picked up in lots of other poems that are playing with time 
and moving between different periods. There is that image of um, kind of knitting and gaps and hollows. There are lots of images throughout these poems of hollows, of dents, of dinges, of all kinds of gaps and um, ditches where bodies may be, where nothing may be. There's lots of images of absence. So there, there are so many, um, yeah, points of connection, I think. And then tonally and, and, and all kinds of other things. I mean, people, I'm sure other people have things to say about this, but, um, and then moments of beauty, as you say as well, that, you know, the Podrick, the Park fake poem, you know, has that stunning song of the ever living little black bell, the blackbird singing down through the centuries, you know, right the way back to the ninth, the 11th century. Um, and he's asking, what is beautiful? What is true? So those questions are still at the heart of this, of this curation as well. There are also lots of poems about individuals like Alan Gillis's poem about his great granny Agnes as a girl. And I think that the, that focalization on, on the individual brings a, um, a almost peaceful uh, musing element to some of the poems in the curation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things for me about the poems was that um, you know, a, a little bit like what we were talking about earlier, Paul, that, you know, the everyday, that people's lives went on through all of this, um, that we, we still, you know, thinking about Joan Newman's poem, that, um, you know, that the, the woman in the hospital was still thinking about getting married and uh, another woman thinking about could she continue on with her nursing and, you know, the, the children being born and the kind of the tenderness around that. Um, the, the fear and the hope that people had for their children, that echoes in so many poems. So I think there, there's a real sense of, um, I suppose, what the curation is about living through this period, um, that we all had to, to find ways to, to live through it. And, to, and I think that's really shown in the poems that the living went on despite everything that was going on around it. I was so glad to hear uh, Robert Frost's name mentioned earlier on <clears throat> with the momentary stay against confusion and uh, that notion of, of staving off that's included in that uh, and indeed stopping. Um, um, you know, I love uh, uh, the, the, that particular usage we have in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> Where are you stopping nearby? Um, you, are you, where are you staying? And it's actually all connected, as, as you know, to the, the notion of a stanza, which is a stopping place, a little room, somewhere where you'd stop, you might stop in the Grand Central Hotel or the Wellington Park or wherever it might be if you were visiting from beyond for a day or two. So I love um, the fact that there are all these connections. And to, to go to your point, perhaps more um, obviously, um, Northern Ireland is a very small place. And our collective experience is um, something that uh, uh, really brings people together. We, we all, we're all very conscious of pretty much the same set of images from day to day, be we, be, uh, whether we're living in the country or the town or moving between the two. And the collective unconscious, um, which, which is um, a phenomenon that I happen to believe in, um, you know, is one of the reasons why there are all those overlaps and uh, all those recurrences uh, of imagery. Uh, not, not only that, but in more literary terms, to go back to Frost, Frost has this great line about how all poems in verse and prose are in conversation with all others. And that also comes across, uh, not just on the day-to-day -day level, but um, uh, in an unconscious way, a conscious way in some cases, it's, it's one of the beauties of uh, the poetry from, from this part of the world. Mm. I love that, uh, the idea of the, the room and the, the stanza as the room and the standing place. Um, and I love the, the line in that Joan Newman poem about, I think it says, 
in the limb fitting center, a young girl was trapped in the middle of the room. And it's such, like just in the limb fitting center is such a great phrase, but then it goes on and you have this image of stasis and somebody um, stuck with a, her artificial limb was jammed. It's just, an, it's an extraordinary image for the, the idea of the poem as well and what the poem is trying to do, but this sense of, of, of being stuck and of being seen and of the sense of contrapment, uh, entrapment and containment and enclosure, but also that the enclosure of the poem is a space of possibility and that this room, this weird room that we find ourselves in, and the, and the poem actually is, is called a stay in Musgrave Hospital, isn't yeah. it? So it's another stay. <laughs> It's it's that has stayed stayed with me. I think um, since I first heard it in that poem as well. The, the uh, we were all part people. Mm. Uh, it's just such a uh, a room that, full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of part people. Yeah. yeah. And what about the? I suppose the occasion poems, um, the poems that, um, for example, uh, ceasefire, um, like a Longley's poem, or the poems that have uh, the dates like. Lorna Shocknessy's Good Friday 1998 or Jean Bleakney's postcard 16th of August 1998. Um, would you like to say a little bit about what those poems are doing in a sense of remembering momentous occasions? I, I think um, Jean Blakeney's poem I find incredibly powerful. Um, I suppose because in that poem there is that, that there's that there, there's on the scales there is the uh, Good Friday Agreement, and on the other side of the scale there is the extreme violence that there was in that year, and there's such a sense for me in that poem of tiredness, you know, of just, um, you know, Jane for me kind of speaks about. Um, we have hope, but we're tired. And I think a lot of those poems that are situated in a certain place have that kind of balance of, of trying to, again, back to the kind of lived experience, we're hoping and we're trying to move forward, but we're living in this at the moment. Um, so I think that um, commemorating those kind of huge moments um, is important, but it's also a commemoration that says, um, it's not just, it's not just this, it's this as well. Um, and I think one of the things for me is that, um, you know, I suppose we, we kind of are constantly told that change comes from the top and that our politicians are doing things for us and are sorting things out. And in my experience, it's people who sort things out. It's people who take um, steps towards each other. It's people who, through acts of kindness or writing a poem or writing a story or sharing a story, whatever it might be, that are, t are, that are um, weaving, you know, to go back to what you were saying, Gail, weaving that kind of place that we can all stand on. Um, and for me, that's what those poems are doing. It's saying this is a big event, but there's also this as well. And what I like is that, you know, we follow those momentous moments, Good Friday 1998 and then Postcard Sunday 16th of August 1998 with Elegy for Patricia Dory, which is the, you know, the very specific where you're speaking about a mother's loss and it's so haunting, you know, this could the body of a girl be folded into an oil drum sealed and dumped as if rubbish, like just those questions. And this idea at the end of the poem about your daughter still smiling at the gone world, the way in which we're in the kind of forever time of the dead um, or the disappeared, where you know the, there's a sense in which as long every news article that's written, every poster that's put, every you know further talk of the life that has been, is we're kind of in this stretched out time of it of of. A gone world, which is not, which is not in fact gone, like this future at the start of the creation, which has has already happened. So we're in this strange kind of double time of repetitions and returns, and um, and again, I think that's a reminder about you know your phrase was intergenerational trauma, but about this question of what what legacy we're leaving for generations to come. You know, for for my son, um, for the, for our kids, for our kids' kids, um, this this kind of double time that we're that we're in. Mm -hmm. But I, I like that we move from the these big dates um, and commemorating on that kind of scale to, to the very particular and that the lens is kind of always widening and, and, and kind of closing again and across this creation, I think. Yeah. 
Well, meaning no harm uh, to our journalists and our historians um, who have done a fabulous job in <clears throat> trying to keep us abreast of the news um, and for whom the debt is the um, you know, kind of the staple right? The staple of the, uh, it, it's, you know, this happened on a particular day in 1969, uh, on, on this particular day in uh, uh, 1690, something happened. Um, but what I admire uh, about the dating of these poems that you refer to um, is that, as I say, meaning no disrespect to journalists and historians. I mean, I do believe that we um, can find out, um, inhabit actually a, a, an historical moment or journalistic moment, um, at least as fully and perhaps more fully in what we think of an, uh, as a work of art, that a poem actually may well <coughs> Um, help us to understand the Seamus Dean poem that you mentioned, for example. I mean, it, uh, to use a cliche, it speaks volumes about a particular um, moment in the history of, of uh, Derry, for example. And, uh, you know, as so many of Seamus uh, Dean's poems did, um, you know, and, um, you know, I, one might go back there as readily as to, uh, you know, a tribunal to find out what was going on really uh, on the streets. Mm. And I think um, in Leontia's poem, I mean, I think the power of words, the kind of, um, you know, the radio and the kind of the, the repetition of those words that we all heard on news bulletins. Uh, I mean, I think you can really see that the, the power of words on in that kind of journalistic uh, fashion to chip away and to, to uh, raise concerns and to, um, to to really blanket us in a sense of fear, um, not unreasonably on occasions, but I think that kind of um, I, I totally agree with you. The kind of the, the the power of a poem to use words to to take us to a slightly different place uh, than just hearing the news and the constant bombardment of um, the kind of words that are coming through the radio. Um, I think that's really important in these poems, yeah. News that stays news. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps we could look at the other um, photograph, um, photograph of Time for Peace. And um, I think that one of the things that strikes me in, in, in the curation is the, um, the sense of consolation and the sense of healing, I think, um, and perhaps that it's a less angry curation than um, the equivalent Ormsby anthology, Rage for Order, um, that there is a sense of, um, of healing and an awareness of the immersiveness of the troubles as a lived experience, but an awareness also of it receding. Would you agree with that? Mm, um, yes, it ha there is no doubt that things have receded. Um, I'm not sure how far they've receded. Uh, I mean, I think kind of, um, for those of us who have lived through um, whatever it is we've lived through, I think there's always a fear that things can go back, that things can get back, uh, worse again. And I think it's a kind of constant uh, daily task almost um, to kind of keep trying to move things forward in whatever way that we individually can, whether that's through poetry, whether it's through art, whether it's through, um, you know, the same, uh, responsibility is on our politicians as well and we have to to keep them to task so i don't think it's a time i think there is a sense of, of hope around but i don't think it's a time for relaxing i don't think it's a time for taking anything for granted um i think that the that um 
as I say, that duty is on all of us to make sure that things uh, don't slip backwards again. And I think that's the kind of constant fear for people, um, certainly for the older generation um, who, who did live through it. Um, I don't know what you, what you think, Gail. What? I suppose I think about this question of what can be done. You know, to think about Michael Longley's poem, Cease Fire, this idea of, you know, I do what must be done, but what must be done, in fact, and what is the cost and the need for reparation or reconciliation or forgiveness, um, to use that kind of language, or even, you know, I don't know if did you use the word redemption, I don't know, but that sense of healing, I don't know. I mean, if we look to the very last poem in the curation matins, everything is going to be all right. There will be dying, there will be dying, um, and everything will be all right. And there's a sense in which even watching the sunrise is to watch day break. So something is is breaking, <laughs> even as I, I, just, I, was listen, I was hearing that poem and you, it's one I love and knew so well, but I was hearing it again and also hearing birdsong in his recording, which is perhaps the most optimistic <laughs> aspect of the entire curation is that you can hear birdsong at the end. Um, but that's a poem in which there's very much a sense of, you know, the future has been written in some ways, there will be dying and, and it's not, and, 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 and what must be done? I mean, these are some of the questions. I think these are the stakes. I mean, to use that, I mean, Paul's poem, and, and this is an extraordinary poem, which, uh, you know, has, has a literal stake, but is asking about what the stakes are for these issues, I think. And I don't think there are any easy answers in this. In fact, I think there's a, there's a lot of mourning. There's a lot of um, pain in these poems in ways that I find very moving. Um, so I... It's not an easy one by any means, but certainly there's life and, and, and love and grace and all kinds of beauty in here, but there, I think there's real difficulty and real questions about what, what must be done. Yeah, yep, there aren't any easy answers, that's for sure. Yeah. It's very appropriate that there be a, a little bird or two in, in the Derek Menon recording, because as I recall, um, that phrase, every, everything's going to be, every little thing's going to be all right, comes from a Bob Marley song called Three Little Birds, which Derek has uh, beautifully repurposed in the Frosty and Way, <laughs> where, where all these things are in conversation mm. with each other. I must say, when I read that poem when it came out, um, I, years ago, you know, whatever the time was, I'm not really sure if I absolutely accepted that at face value. I assumed that there was a somewhat ironized component to everything is going to be all right, right? Oh dear, yeah, yeah. such a dark yeah. irony. Yeah, yeah I, I think so, and I, you know, we're so desperate at the moment to find, um, uh, to find. Um, what would one say, sucker, S-U-C-C-O-U-R, in poetry that would, you know, uh, in particularly in the COVID-19 moment, you know, so desperate to find uh, uh, poems that will respond to that. I mean, sort of desperately looking for a Seamus Heaney poem, or at least something from Heaney, if not a poem, that will make us feel better. I actually think it's a great moment uh, for all of us to be reminded that poetry does not necessarily make us feel better and nor should it necessarily make us feel better and actually it's not a bad thing to be kept on our toes and then by extension to keep other people who are using language uh, like our politicians on our toes mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why we still have a bit to go is that we haven't all you know we're not all we're not all using the same language and we're not all abs being absolutely coming ex absolutely clean right? <laughs> We're very good at telling ourselves little lies. And when we get out of that, uh, maybe we have a chance. And maybe then everything will actually be all right. Well, I th you know, I think for me that about the cur curation that um, th there is some sucker in the poems, but there is also, I mean, there, there isn't comfort there, really. Um, I mean, a lot of the poems, I think, are, are, are asking us to look directly in the face of what happened and what people's lived experiences were. And for me, that's the power of these poems is that we're being asked to hear 
we're being asked to look at things, we're being asked to understand, um, not just to, to uh, um, accept the kind of old tropes. We're being um, asked to listen and to really understand, and that for me is the power of this curation. And the last poem for me, it kind of in the context of the curation, it almost feels for me in this context to be um, one of those kind of affirmations that you say to yourself, you know, that you don't necessarily believe it, but you have to go on, you say it, you, you act you as if it... You repeat it over and over again. Yes, you in act France, as if it they was call true. that the method coué. Right, right, yeah. So that for me is the kind of the last poem, is, has that kind of effect, particularly I think when it, you know, the fact that it comes at the end and you've listened to all the dying and all the, the, all the, um, the, the, the emotion that's contained in those other poems. It's a kind of, uh, it's, almost, it's almost a little call to arms, the last poem, um, in, in the kind of, in the way of, um, you know, girding yourself for, um, what you will need to continue to do um, to make sure that some things will be all right. If that makes any sense. A reminder, that, uh, a reminder I mean, to, to, to come back to what you were saying, Paul, uh, about, you know, using language in the right way and um, making sure um, that the end of art is peace. Um, and, and, and so, the strength of the poems as well is plunging us back into the immediacy of those terrible moments. Uh, yes, I mean, certainly the end of art is peace. It was, was a quotation uh, from, I believe, was it Hopkins? Um, Coventry Patmore, I think. Oh, Co I beg your pardon. Of course it was Coventry Patmore. Uh, no, I'm, I'm mis misapplying it, uh, mis misrepresenting it because I think Seamus Heaney, who uses that phrase, um, also has something from Hopkins journals um, at, that, at that moment. But you know, um, um, the end of art is peace in a certain sense, in a certain sense, in the sense where we started off with it being a momentary stay against confusion, right? There is a clearing, a clarification to use another Frostian image. There's a momentary clarity, right? And it might be coincide with a notion of peace. Um, but uh, again, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm always a little concerned about uh, our insistence that poets do the work of bringing peace and reconciliation and succor and solace. I would like to see our elected uh, officials doing that. <laughs> I really would. I'd like to see them doing that. I think, you know, um, for me, one of the, the uh, best things I've read recently was uh, Anna Byrne's novel, Milkman. Mm -hmm. um, and there was so much in that that, um, you know, there's one scene in it where um, they're in her evening French class and the teacher asks them to look out the window and describe the colours of the sky. And she talks about... Um, the sky can't be anything other than blue. You know, it, we've all accepted it's blue. It can't be any other colour. And there's kind of moments in that, um, in that book for me, that kind of talk about the power of art and the power of um, uh, creation, creative thinking, and the power of imagination. Um, and so it's not. I don't think it's our, our. You know, I don't think it's the duty of poets to to kind of make anything happen, but I think there is a responsibility to create as best as you can the art that will make people think, that will, you know, take us out of this binary thinking that we all tend to, to fall into, that will say, look, there is, there's a, a, there's a whole spectrum of colours here. And I think that for me is um, what art does best. And Gerard McLaughlin's poem in the second tongue is a reminder that, you know, poetry's responsibility might be to curse as well as anything that might be considered to be in, in any way more reconciliatory. Like it, it has many functions and it might be, it, might, it can remember the dead or misremember the dead, but it can also become chant and song and curse and call out um, the injustices that it perceives. You know, we're seeing that at the minute with so many 
works of poetry, in fact, that are calling out the violence that we're seeing um, against black bodies in the US, for yeah. example. You know, we're seeing that calling out happening. People like Terence Hayes, people like Claudia Rankin asking questions about justice and, or just us, to quote Claudia Rankin's most recent book. So I think, you know, yes, I think we are living through a moment where there's pressure being put on poets and on the poem to do this kind of full reconciliation <laughs> work um, because of a, you know, it's a, it's a wider move. I think we're, we've, lo we've lost some faith actually in what poetry can do and in, its men in the many things that it can do and the things that it can, in fact, make happen. But uh, yeah, I think in McLaughlin's poem in this is a reminder that cursing is, is a, as important as anything else, I think. Yeah. Um, or, and just that shape-shifting quality that that poem has, that the tongue has in that poem, that yes. the tongue is capable of so many things, of violences as well as other mm -hmm. things. I mean, even Derek Mahan's Sunlight, it's a riot of sunlight. And in the context of this, that takes us back to Kieran Carson's, you know, yeah. Belfast <laughs> Confetti. That's, we're right back there. We haven't left it. You know, we're still in that imaginative zone, if you like. Um, yeah. Um, so thank you all so much for this very stimulating conversation uh, where we explored the word for stay and the, the jukebox new curation. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Maura Donaldson, who's the co-curator with um, Maria McManus of this jukebox, to Gail McConnell and to Paul Muldoon. Um, and we encourage you to go and listen to the jukebox in its various locations. And I'll remind you where they are from the 1st of October to the 31st of December in the Crescent Arts Centre in Belfast. At the same period, you're going to have another jukebox at the Epic Museum in Dublin. And from the 4th of January to the 21st of March at the Centre Culturel Irlandais in Paris. And there's also a link to listen to the jukebox online at the crescentartcenter.org. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.